going to turn to, oh sorry, page two, oh, 251, go tell it on the map. If you can stand, please be right back. I just want to let everyone here know that you get extra credit today, okay? You get church extra credit. There are two Sundays in the year that are the least attended Sundays of the year. Number one is July 4th weekend. I wouldn't understand why. Number two is the Sunday after Christmas. Because everybody went to Christmas Eve service or some other and they said check for the week. So everybody in here this morning gets extra church credit for the week. So congratulations. Uh, a couple announcements before we get going. If you could uh, fill out your connection cards as the uh, ushers pass them by. Also, Patty Baldwin will be having a birthday party next, uh, next Sunday. So that's also in your bulletin. Um, let us pray together. Merciful God, in Christ you have come among us and we rejoice. Yet still the world groans in hope of redemption. Open our hearts to hear you speaking today in and through some difficult texts. By your spirit give us grace so that we deny neither the sufferings that remain nor the hope that is given through you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may stand and greet someone this morning. Shake it like a man, son. <laughs>
the call to worship. God has come among us. Let us rejoice. For God's name alone is exalted. in your hymnal. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights. Praise the Lord, all the nations. Praise the Lord, all the hosts. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Praise the Lord, all shining stars. Let them praise the name of the Lord who commanded, and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters, and all deeps. Mountains and hills, fruit trees, and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name alone is exalted, whose glory is above earth and heaven.
on up for Children's Church. Good morning. How are you guys today? Are you worn out from Christmas yet? No. No, you can keep charging along, right? All right. Well, this morning we're starting a sermon series that we're calling Let's Get Liturgical. Um, and one of the parts of this series is colors. Have you noticed what colors are on the stage? We have gold, we have purple, we have blue. We have all these different colors, and all these colors mean something. So each Sunday, I don't know if you've noticed, I wear a different pair of shoes each Sunday. Some Sundays I wear green shoes, and some Sundays I wear purple ones, and red ones, and white, and blue, and this are, these are my personal favorite. My gold ones. These were hard to find, okay? But I wear these shoes for a reason. The shoes match the colors. See how the gold matches the gold on my shoes? Well, each color stands for something. So blue is the color we just had for Advent, right? So we just had blue the last four weeks. Blue is a color that suggests hope. Hope. Blue is the color of royalty as we welcome a coming king. So that's why we use blue. Then we go to white. White calls us to remember the purity of a newborn Jesus. It helps us remember that Christ is pure, and because of that, we are pure, which is why we have white. Then we have green. Green is the one that I get so tired of wearing green. We wear green most of the year. We wear green to symbolize growth. There are seasons of growth in the church. is why we wear the green. Then we wear purple. <laughs> purple is my favorite one. Go cats. Uh, we wear purple. Purple is associated with Lent. It suggests repentance. Then we have red. You can tell I wore these ones before I started this one. These are a little dingy. I'm sorry, they probably smell a little bad too. <laughs> but the red ones we wear on Pentecost. And they remind us of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And finally, gold. These only get to be worn three times a year. So they're special. And gold symbolizes what is precious and valuable. And it symbolizes a joy and a celebration, which is why we wear gold on Christmas Eve and the week after Christmas, and we wear gold on Easter Sunday. Those are our times of celebration. So now, when someone says, why, why is it green again in the church? You can be like, it's time for us to grow, right? So right, church? Yeah? All right. So let us pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for silly little things like colors. Or in our Psalter today, thank you for creepy things and, and uh, sea monsters. We appreciate you, Lord, for all the fun things that you give us, all the things you let us experience in this life. As we celebrate the Christ child, let us do so with joy and celebration today. Amen? Amen. Amen. Oh, thanks, guys. You know, one of the things about this uh, Let's Get Liturgical series is, is doing the Psalters and the call to worship and all these ancient practices of worship. Um, I, I will have to admit, this week as I prepared, uh, I had a good laugh when I had to type in the word creepy things. You know, it, it, made, it, uh, it made it special for me this week. So I hope you enjoy as we, as, as we experience them today. Will you join me in an attitude of prayer? Blessed Lord, of the many ways in which you care for us and guide us. This has been a hectic time for so many of us. We have invested ourselves, our energies, and our resources in a flurry of activity. Join me in an attitude of prayer. Blessed Lord, of the many ways in which you care for us and guide us. This has been a hectic time for so many of us. We have invested ourselves, our energies, and our resources in a flurry of activities. Now we are coming into the end of this calendar year with a new year in view. 
and we wonder how we are going to have the energy that the new year will demand. Help us place our trust and our lives in your care once again. And as Joseph listened to the angel telling him to follow, help us follow you in all of our ways. Give us strength and courage for the times ahead. Let love be the foundation from which all our actions spring. Bless us and keep us in your care. For we ask this in the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom that is in heaven. Give us this day our daily Forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And King, we're just going to do verses one through three. Before we begin our offering, I missed a very important announcement. Now, I may have saved this announcement, that way there's more food left for me, but after church today, there is a brunch downstairs, so please, if you're able, join us, and I won't eat it all. Will you join me in a prayer for our offering this morning? Magnificent God, you created the universe, and your wisdom shines through the laws of nature that we discern. In the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, you worked a miracle to bring salvation. Through your awesome deeds, you light an inextinguishable hope in our hearts. Help our congregation to work together in new ways to tell others your amazing good news. May our tithes and offerings support your work through our outreach ministries. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 23. Now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise man, he was infuriated. And he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were seeking the child's life are dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. For the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, sir. It's a great day. All right. It's a great day. I'm excited about this sermon series. I really am. It's called Let's Get Liturgical. And as United Methodists and other mainline denominations, we have a tradition. Now, every time I hear tradition, I think of Fiddler on the Roof. Anybody else with me? Tradition! We follow this thing called the Revised Common Lectionary. In layman's terms... The lectionary is a cycle of three years of readings that rotate each and every year. This year, we are going to follow the lectionary on special Sundays. So special Sundays in the calendar, we will, we will come back to this series. So this will be a reoccurring series that we see throughout 2020. We will also participate in some of the liturgical readings from those Sundays, like we did today with the Psalter, like we did through Advent. Learning and enjoying the colors of the seasons, participating in the ancient while striving to make it new and fresh and relevant. So my goal in this series that we're going to have multiple times throughout this year is that we learn our story, learn why the church does some of the things the church does. If you have never been in a church and you walked into this church on a Sunday morning, There's going to be some things we do, you go, hmm, why do we sit and stand 17 times before he preaches? Why do we pray about creepy things and, and, and sea monsters? So if you don't know the story, it's hard to answer the questions when you're asked. So I hope that when we leave 2020, we'll know what Epiphany Sunday means. We'll know what Ascension Sunday is. We'll know what Good Friday is. We'll know what Pentecost is. You see, I think sometimes we all assume we know these things, myself included. But I think it's good to always have a refresh and a re-examination of those ancient traditions. The church nerd inside of me is really excited for this one. Anyways, a day that started way too early, I might add. Anybody else have an early start on Christmas morning? It wasn't the kids. My mother was awake at 4 a.m., My mom was the one that was getting the house up early. And as I sat there that evening, a little bit exhausted, the kids were asleep, Amber was asleep, I was the only one up in the house. 
These are the thoughts that were running through my head. Are you ready to start the diet tomorrow? Was number one. It was strongly on my mind at that point. I could feel in that moment how tight my jeans were, and I was thinking to myself, I'm glad this is over. I was beat. Back-to-back -back trips home for Christmas get-togethers, two Christmas Eve services, more food than any human should ever eat in a week. My mind in that moment went to this, I'm ready to get back to my normal. I'm ready to eat normally again. I'm ready to get up in the morning and read and go to the gym. I'm ready for my normal routine to be back. And in that moment, I noticed something about myself. That I do this each and every year. I get so excited about Christmas. My wife says too early, but when Walmart can celebrate, so can I. I think this time... The tree is up November 1st. It's time for eggnog and butter cookies. <laughs> then by the time Christmas arrives, I have what the Urban Dictionary calls Christmas fatigue. Anybody else have any Christmas fatigue this year? And as I noticed this about myself, I had to do one of those heart check moments. You ever do any heart check moments? Where you're like, man, why do I feel this way? And you have to stop and like check yourself. I had a check yourself moment sitting in my easy chair on Christmas night. And then I went to sleep. I didn't let it linger too long. And I woke up Thursday morning with a mindset of 12 days of Christmas. I'm not going to cut the Christmas season short this year. With this renewed sense of Christmas zeal, Thursday morning, I sat down to start preparing my sermon for today, and I reread Matthew 2, 13 through 23. My first thought was this, this story is not helping the Christmas spirit. We go from the nativity to slaughtering babies in four days. How is this going to preach? I then flashed back to a childhood memory. See, we had a tradition growing up. Tradition! Each year, my, as a family, we would all go to a living nativity. This living nativity was in West Wichita. A church each year would put on this performance. I remember it was always freezing cold. But they had live animals and hot cocoa, so I was in. <laughs> the story was told by a recording, and the voiceover pieces were memorable especially the voice of King Herod. Mindset of 12 days of Christmas. I'm not going to cut the Christmas season short this year. With this renewed sense of Christmas zeal, Thursday morning I sat down to start preparing my sermon for today. And I reread Matthew 2, 13 through 23. My first thought was this. This story is not helping the Christmas spirit. We go from the nativity to slaughtering babies in four days. How is this going to preach? I then flash back to a childhood memory. See, we had a tradition growing up. Tradition! Each year, my, as a family, we would all go to a living nativity. This living nativity was in West Wichita, a church each year would put on this performance. I remember it was always freezing cold, but they had live animals and hot cocoa, so I was in. <laughs> the story was told by a recording, and the voiceover pieces were memorable, especially the voice of King Herod. A rather, a rather large, grown man on his makeshift throne and mouth along with a creepy voice. This part of the story would get me every time. A part of the nativity, I can remember in his Grinch-like voice, firstborn baby boys under the age of two. I can still remember that. Clear as day. And as a child, this was a shocking development to the story. 
We just had this magical moment of celebrating the birth of a Christ child and someone is already trying to kill him. That escalated quickly. So fast forward to Thursday. In my renewed Christmas spirit, I was once again hit with the same shock. And my first thought was, this is just too soon. This reading, this story, it comes way too soon. Can we at least have a couple of weeks to remain joyful? Can we have a couple of weeks to celebrate Christmas? We just sang songs with the words, infant so tender and mild, silent night, O little town of Bethlehem. And now we're stuck with this difficult transition. We go from Luke's story of a mother giving birth to her firstborn child with angels greeting shepherds, offering words of peace on earth and goodwill to all to the killing of innocent children. We sit here this morning with a scene in the nativity that we would like to forget. Jesus and his family flee to Egypt to avoid the horrific actions of King Herod. This first Sunday after Christmas, the lectionary does not allow us to dwell on Jesus as a baby in a manger. This first Sunday after Christmas, we already see a picture of a suffering God. In all honesty, it is not the reading or sermon I want to have preached the Sunday after Christmas. As I was wondering, how do you make this hard transition? A single tweet was sent out that made a lot of buzz over the Christmas break. This tweet was sent out by presidential candidate Mayor Pete Budig. Millions around the world in celebrating the arrival of divinity on earth. Riches, but in poverty. Not as a citizen, but as a refugee. No matter, no matter where or how you celebrate, Merry Christmas. Seems like a harmless tweet. The tweet of Jesus being a refugee was in reference to the story that we read this morning. Yes, I do think the tweet was intentionally political. Statement directed towards our immigration and refugee policy. The fact when Jesus and his family had to flee to Bethlehem, from Bethlehem in fear of their life, Jesus was in that moment a refugee. What can we learn from this event in history? A simple statement about this complex situation. Mary and Joseph were displaced by a violent government and sought refuge in a foreign land. The United Nations uh, for Refugees says the refugees is the, a refugee is defined in this way. Someone who has been forced to flee their country because of persecution, war, violence. A refugee has a well-founded fear of persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. I think Jesus, check, check, and check. Jesus and his family are strangers in a foreign land. So what truth about God can we learn from this story? In the Christ child, the one in whom we celebrated just a few short days ago, our tradition and our doctrine lends us to believe that Jesus took on humanity in every way. That Jesus is fully God. I imagine as the days passed after Jesus' birth, the joy of Mary and Joseph as Jesus for the first time sucks his thumb. As Jesus for the first time discovers his toes. As Jesus uh, cries in the middle of the night for food. I imagine Jesus as he says his first words, as he takes his first steps, as he hides behind Joseph's legs when he's scared. Or how he runs to Mary after he skins his knee. I see Jesus watching his father in the carpentry shop playing with the wood shavings. I see Jesus helping Mary prepare food before an afternoon meal. I see Jesus getting that stern look when he's testing his parents' patience. 
Isn't this the beautiful thing about having a child? Those are the moments we live for as parents. That first word, that first step. But there is an underlying fear as well. There's an underlying fear that when you become a parent, you immediately become aware of just how fragile life can be. I think Mary and Joseph experienced this in that moment. They knew their child was special. They would enjoy the tender moments, but live in fear when his life was threatened in a dangerously insane ruler that put their family on the run, desperate, terrified, hiding, determined to survive. In every newborn baby, there is an amazing promise of the future. Yet this ever-present fear of danger, illness, evil, I think if this would not have been true for Jesus, if Jesus had never been scared or in danger or suffered at the hands of an oppressor, if Jesus had never been a refugee, then we would not truly, he would not truly have been one of us. Think about it, church. Emmanuel, God with us, would not mean that much if God was only with us during the celebration. Emmanuel, God with us, would not mean that much if Jesus was only involved in the joyous parts of our lives. I think it would be shallow. In Reverend uh, Junius Dotson's book, Soul Reset, he talks about how we view God in Christ on the mountain and in the valleys. On the mountain, times like Christmas Eve, times like birth of a baby, these joyful, productive times, times when life is amazing. He says those are times we tend to talk about God. In the valley, these times of suffering, times of pain, sorrow, times when we are refugees to our own life, in those times we talk to God. When we know difficulty, illness, or loss, because of stories like today, we experience a Jesus who knows our story. We talk to a God who has walked a mile in God who has feared for his life. We talk to a God that has ran in fear. We talk to a God that is not above the fray, but one who is intimately close. See, this is the radical truth and beauty of Christmas. That we can go from the beauty of birth to the desperation of fleeing a country in just a few short verses. But think about it. Can you truly know joy if you've never known sorrow? Can you truly know peace if you've never known fear? But we have in Christ one who walks it with us. So I will do my best to not let Christmas go so fast this year. I will overcome my of joy and fear for just a few more days. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we come to you in this place. Many of us have felt like refugees in our own lives, running scared, fearful of something. I'm thankful that you've experienced that. That when we come to you in supplication, when we come to you on our faces, when we come to you with tears running down our face, we know we approach a God who's experienced it also. You promise to walk with us in those moments. To guide us. You said you will guide us. Without sorrow, we can never really experience joy. Let us go to you this day. And keep our eyes focused on you. In Christ's name, amen.
now that you've heard that, that song's missing a verse, isn't it? Do you, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? That song's missing a verse. There should have been another verse. They flee to Egypt. Because that's part of the story. It's part of the story that God came and suffered. That's part of the story. Let's not clean it up. It's part of the story because when we experience the same things in life, we serve a God who's been there. Amen? Amen. Go forth in love and serve God in all that you do. And God's strength comfort the afflicted. Pressed. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love with you, now and always, and to all the ages.